Floyd. He's going to tell us about quantum generative adversarial networks. Excellent, yes. <clears throat> right. Quantum generative adversarial networks, QGANs. Um, I note that I have, I, for those of you doing this, there's a, you get a choice between uh, low order odor or bold color. <laughs> I'm going for the bold color. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, unless it's really stinky. So, <laughs> so um, uh, uh, who here was at the talk yesterday morning on classical generative adversarial networks? A lot of people, right? So, <clears throat> but not everybody. That's okay. So, uh, yes, generative adversarial networks are a really neat uh, and relatively new innovation in machine learning. And it's particularly relevant for this day and age. Here we have, we have a, uh, it's, as they say, these are, are, can be phrased as an adversarial game. So the way it works is um, uh, there's some data and there's some real data and then there's a generator <clears throat> who is generating fake data. So, you know, here's my real data. And here's my fake data. Whoop. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the generator, generator, <clears throat> I should make this his hair red. Sorry, <laughs> I don't <know> red. <laughs> he is trying to fool a discriminator, whose uh, job it is <clears throat> job it is to tell the real data from the fake data. Okay, so um, <clears throat> and uh, this is the discriminator. Now I'm going to, for the sake of exposition, I'm going to refer to the discriminator as she. We can call her Deirdre the discriminator, and the generator as he. We'll call him Jerry, the generator. Not Just Christine and Brett. Not Christine and Brett. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Whew. <What> a show. <laughs> And so the way that this game works um, in its uh, original version, I'm going to describe the simplest version, is that the discriminator is presented with a, either a piece, a real datum or a fake datum. She doesn't know which. And then she inputs that into her network, which could be her neural network, could be some kind of deep perceptron. And then she tries to decide, is it real or is it fake? And classically, what she does is uh, uh, so the real data. Let's let's say the real data occurs with probability p of x. The fake data occurs with probability q of x. The generator is trying to match, get q of x to be as close to p of x as possible, and the discriminator is given a piece of data x, tries to say, hey, did it come from this distribution or this distribution? And they're both equipped with networks, that's why deep neural networks, which is um, why uh, it's called generative adversarial networks. And the claim is, and I'll actually, I think it'll be fun for to actually go through the kind of uh, sketch, the classical version of the proof of this claim, is that <clears throat> the unique fixed point for this adversarial game is when the generator generates the real uh, data with the same statistics as the real data. So the fake data is indistinguishable from the real data. Now, I should say that I only started working on this about five months ago. Last spring, Christian Wheatbrook at Xanadu asked me to take a look at this paper because he said, look, this is a cool technique. We should think about quantizing it. And the paper, the, the original paper on this, which has many thousands of citations, uh, says that they're going to prove that this process of generator using his network to generate fake data 
with the statistics to try to max the real data and the discriminator using her network to try to discriminate between this, that the paper says we're going to prove that this actually, this process converges with the generator generating the real data. And I was thought that really stunning because in deep neural networks you can never prove anything. So I was like, this is going to be great. This is like amazing. They're going to prove something absolutely incredible. But, but isn't the intuition for that proof just, well, suppose that they weren't generating the real data, then there is some you know, network of some size that can discriminate, and so then you're not at a big point. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually, I will, I'll, yeah, it's, it's kind of like that, right? Is, 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 it, is there more to it than that? Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't give it away. <laughs> so this is a min, a min max problem. Uh, this is the max, the discriminator does the maximing, the generator does the minimizing. Um, uh, and you take the, uh, uh, you're going to take the expectation value over the real data P of log of D. D is the, is the probability that the discriminator uh, figures out that this is the data is fake minus uh, plus uh, uh, the ex expectation value over Q of log of one minus D. Okay, this is how they, I'm just saying how they set it up. You could have chosen any loss function you want, but as was mentioned yesterday, they chose a logarithmic loss function for reasons that will become obvious in a second. And they alternate, alternate first, uh, 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 fix G update D, and then we fix. So first, the generator generates statistics with uh, um, uh, fake data with a, a fixed statistics, and then the discriminator generates real. Uh, then the discriminator gets to try to distinguish, so she gets some time to try to figure this out, and then then you you switch. Then the the discriminator fixes her network, and then the generator uh, gets to update his. And now I will actually show how they prove that these networks uh, converge to the proper value. So um, the, um, the optimal, optimal value for D, given a particular output, <coughs> given X, is she wants to assign a probability that goes as P of X over or, uh, P of X plus Q of X. That's the probability that she should assign that it's that it's real. If so, if it's if it's higher has a higher probability of being real according to the real data, she should assign a higher probability. If it's lower, she should assign a lower probability. And you get this merely by um, um, this is d star. This is you just take the derivative of this expression for d's maximization with respect to um, uh, uh, her d star. This this d right here. So this is very easy to show. It makes sense. And then. <coughs> Then actually, if you look at excess minimization, generator, this is the discriminator. Um, <coughs> generator is then, if you pick this value for D, so if the, the discriminator finds the best possible method for, for, minimize, for maximizing her probability of success, or maximizing rather this particular logarithmic function, then uh, the generator is, uh, uh, is trying to minimize <coughs> the, uh, kolbach lieber distance between uh, P and P plus Q over 2 and uh, plus the kolbach lieber distance of Q and P plus Q over 2. So this is the function the generator is trying to minimize. Okay? You just plug in this value into this expression and then you find this is what the generator is trying to do. This is the same as the uh, uh, Jensen <coughs> Shannon divergence because it's, it's a symmetrized version of the kolbach lieber distance between, between two um, probability distributions. It's not a distance, so I don't think it obeys the triangle inequality. So, <coughs> uh, but at least it's symmetric, which the kolbach lieber distance is not. <coughs> um, <coughs> and you see that this is, uh, this is convex, convex optimization. With a unique minimum uh, at p equals q. And so, <clears throat> I mean, this is, all, this is all very straightforward. And I was reading along in the paper saying, you know, well, OK, OK, this makes sense. Makes sense. It's like, um, so but where's the proof that the neural networks converge to this? 
So after they, they give this, you know, so, you know, so certainly if D can fi figure out, you know, everything that's going on exactly by sampling enough, and if the discriminator can then, you know, do uh, his optimization on the space of all the probabilities, then it's certainly going to converge to this unique fixed point. So, yeah. Uh, so no, so I, I, unlike you in your talk, so I'm actually because this is a physicsy talk. I know my audience here. Uh, uh, I have, of course, the, the the idea here is that I I left out the part which people found confusing yesterday, which is this. So the uh, the uh, generator actually the, the data that they're generating is supposed to be it lives in the same space. So the dimension of that space is the same. But what you're referring to is the fact that the generator is given a random number generator and has to generate these probabilities via this random number generator. I'm just leaving that part out because actually for this purpose it's not, not actually relevant. What you say is correct, but, but, uh, uh, but the, these, the x, the data is the, just the data and this, these live in the same dimensional space. But what is the space of possible discriminators that is being assumed here? Well, they're supposed to be given a deep uh, perceptron. Um, and, but let me actually say what happened. So, so, so I, will, I will actually, so their actual device has a whole bunch of parameters and weights and they're trying to adjust it. So let me actually read what they say at this point. So I was reading along, reading along. Everything's great. I love this. This is very physics-y, so really it, nice. Is this for like any size network? Like you just pick the size of the network? Uh, let me just read what they say, right? So, so, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so they go through this argument. I'm, I'm reading now I'm about three quarters of the way through their paper, this famous paper. And here's the, here's the rest of the proof. So I think you'll agree that this part, if you're allowed to vary these probability distributions completely independently, it's convex optimization, everything's fine. So here they say, in practice, adversarial nets represent a limited family of distributions via some function g of z of theta of g, where the thetas are the weights. And we optimize theta of g rather than p of g itself. Using a multi-layer perceptron to define G introduces multiple critical points in the parameter space, that is to say, many saddle points and local minima, et cetera, so it's no longer convex optimization. However, the excellent performance of multi-layer perceptrons in practice suggests that they are a reasonable model to use despite their lack of theoretical guarantees. And that's the end of the proof. So, <laughs> when I got to that point, said, this is a field I must enter, because if this is their standard of proof, then I, can, I, I, I can do that too. <laughs> With due respect to your field, I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, so, and I learned, I learned in a moment there, I actually, I almost fell off my chair laughing. Chris Christian asked what was the matter with me. So, <laughs> I learned that actually, you know, <laughs> you can prove stuff and then you're allowed in this field to say, oh, and uh, when we put it on a deep neural net, then it works, right? So this is considered to be a proof. This is great. So I said, okay, armed with this information, I said, let's do the quantum version of this. <laughs> no, come on, you have to admit it's entertaining. You're looking, you're looking nervous right there. Come on. <laughs> You know, they say they're going to prove it, and then they say, oh, <laughs> I understand that this is conventional on this field. So. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. They just reiterate, okay, you can't prove anything about deep neural but networks. Just so. to be clear, so you're saying something was proved here, but so then what's the part that's not proved? Like, well, well what is it that makes it non regular Oh, it's be <clears throat> because um, uh, 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 Q, uh, the, the generator is generating is um, some function of, uh, 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 we have x, and it's also some function of the weights, they call it theta of the generator of this deep neural network. And although this, this is convex optimization in the space of the Q of x, it most certainly is not going to be in the space of the theta sub g. So, uh, and as they, as they say, truthfully, You'll introduce all kinds of singular points and saddle points and local minima, et cetera. And so there's no longer convex in the theta g. So, and you're doing, trying to do stochastic gradient descent, for example, on the space of the theta g. And so. I'm still confused why they didn't have to say anything about the discriminator. Yeah, the, the discriminator also in this, and actually, by the way, so, so uh, uh, now having, 
having having a, a laugh at the expense of machine learning. I thought that your talk yesterday was wonderful about this because uh, it addressed all the parts that I thought were bogus about the original paper. It's like, you know, <clears throat> okay. So uh, also D is assumed to have enough statistics and to be able to do stochastic gradient descent on the space of her theta sub D to be able to find a, a network that when you know that will actually identify a spit out you know for a given x spit out this number right so this is also assumed right and so the so in fact there there if you actually if you actually do something more realistic where you know they are not it's not convex optimization that's trying to do it, which you were talking about yesterday, uh, then you know, you can, they can chase each other around in circles, they can end up in funny places, and then, then they cannot converge. And it takes actually heroic effort, which, which you and your collaborators made, actually to prove that they converge, since you're actually, by assuming everything was Gaussian, which is, you know, we, we, as a physicist, I prove of this because uh, <laughs> that's the only thing we do, is assume everything is Gaussian, even we know full well that they're not, then, <laughs> then you can prove stuff, and by God, you're able to prove that it converged. And it, that was not easy, so, all right. Thank you for answering that by means of not answering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, this is, this is the original version of the classical version. If you went to the, uh, went to the talk yesterday morning, you know that there are many, 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 many different advantages of, of versions of these. You can have many different kinds of loss functions, not the logarithmic loss functions. Yesterday was talking about quadratic loss functions. And, so, but they work well. And um, so it makes sense to try to look at the quantum version of this. And I actually claim, uh, this is by the way, uh, uh, with Christian Reed book. And you can find it on the web. It also was just published in Physical Review Letters, this paper. Okay, so. <clears throat> I actually claim the quantum version is easier. <clears throat> um, and the proof of convergence is easier. It's going to be extremely straightforward. And the reason is exactly because we don't need to uh, equip the generator with some kind, of, um, some kind of random number generator because quantum mechanics already generates prop is already probabilistic on its own. So you don't have to worry about you know, this, these hidden random number generators and things like that and whether the dimension of this hidden space matches the other one or not, because the generator is just creating <coughs> quantum states. So the real data has a density matrix rho, and the fake data has a density matrix sigma. And uh, the idea is that we, these describe some ensemble. So we, we pick uh, psi from the density, from the ensemble belonging to described by rho or from sigma. We present it to the discriminator. The discriminator makes a measurement and then tries to find, uh, you know, to see if this is uh, real data or fake data. Similarly, then the generator, once the discriminator fixes her measurement, the generator is now allowed to try to generate new fake data and, uh, uh, and to see if he can get closer. Now, um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, or it could be mixed states. I'm just going to pick states from an ensemble described by this density matrix. Any, 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 it could be any decomposition you like. It doesn't matter because the only thing that's important is actually the density operators. But you're quite right about that, too. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. So um, uh, here, here the situation is, is rather uh, nice because we actually know that the, uh, we know what the minimum error measurement is. Because this was told derived by Hellstrom in 1970 or 71, it is a, a is a it has operators p. It's a projector. I'll call p projects onto the positive part of rho minus sigma. 
Of course, there's a classical version of this as, as well. And then, um, and similarly, 1 minus p, the other, the other operator is 1 minus p. So if uh, uh, this is the same, and this projects on the positive part of sigma minus rho, symmetric. So if, um, if uh, Deirdre, the discriminator, knew this, uh, this measurement, she could just perform it. And if she gets the result corresponding to this, she says, aha, I believe that it's the um, real data. If she gets this result, she says, aha, I believe it's the fake data. And this will minimize her probability of error. So you see how this is much simpler. This is actually much simpler than the classical case. The, classically, the classical discriminator has to take in the data and then has to use her network to generate a scalar which she declares to be the probability that the data is real or fake. Here, because quantum mechanics is probabilistic, she, she shouldn't do that. She should just, you know, that we know what the thing is that she should do. Now, she doesn't know how to do this, but, <clears throat> the, uh, but, you know, so, but, but it's fine because what she does, you know, what in this process, when the discriminator is updating her method, her measurement, then she's getting feedback, right? You know, she says, I think this was real, and then they, the, the referee says, aha, ha, ha, it was fake, right? <laughs> and then he says, I think this was fake. You're right, this was fake, right? So she knows what her probability of success is. So if D tries to maximize um, <clears throat> or minimize probability of error, which is to say she's maximizing her probability of success, ipso facto, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> She can do, uh, this is, she can do, uh, this is a function, which is a function of, um, uh, of um, given her measurement. So <clears throat> where she has, uh, uh, she can do stochastic gradient descent. I mean, she can actually just do gradient descent. It doesn't matter <clears throat> because uh, this probability of error is uh, a linear function of the measurement. Um, and we have M. Uh, m uh, real plus m fake is equal to the identity. So this is a positive operator valued measure. So for those who are not quantum mechanic, not quantum mechanical, the uh, <coughs> a, a generalized measurement is a set of two positive operators that sum to the identity. <coughs> so um, this is a uh, it's a convex space. And she is optimizing a linear function in a convex space. And so she can just do gradient descent and she'll go in the direction of the right thing. Indeed, if you use the same assumption that's in this paper, she will find this optimal measurement and then she'll be good to go. Okay? So you see how it's easier if it's like, A, it's not, you know, we don't have to worry about, we know what the right thing to do is. She wants to minimize her probability of error. This is now, you know, it's, it's a convex optimization problem, a linear, optimizing a linear function. So, hey, that's not, not hard. So, so what assumption did you make here to get rid of the local minimum? I'm not assuming. I'm, I, again, there's no, no quantum networks have been introduced so far. Okay. So the question, the assumption is merely that, that the, 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 the discriminator is able to explore the space of all okay, POVs. Okay, good. good, good, excellent. So we're going to do exactly the same thing, since this is traditional, evidently. So we're going to follow the traditions of the, of the field of deep learning, and we're going to prove a bunch of really fun stuff, which, by the way, actually, may I recommend reading papers like these papers, like, you know, the, these kind of classic deep learning papers are a lot of fun because you, and, and easy to understand for folks doing physics, because people are always, actually, not surprisingly, because people like Hopfield were physicists, you know. <clears throat> uh, uh, they're always minimizing things that look like kullback liebler distances and free energies and stuff like that. So you can just like apply your intuition and you'll understand the proofs. It's great. And, again, and the unique minimum here is going to be rho equal sigma? For sure. Yeah. yeah, because if we now look at, at what the generator does, so <coughs> the, uh, I'm sorry? So the generator, what, for this being fixed, so we haven't talked about that. First, the, the, uh, the, um, the discriminator is, um, is, first we talked about what this, the generator is fixed and then the discriminator optimizes her uh, minimum error measurement. 
So now we just let the generator do it. So the generator is wants to wants to find sigma to maximize the uh, probability of error. <coughs> Sorry. But now again, it's this is trivial because the set of density matrices is set of density matrices is convex. If we have sigma for any measurement that the discriminator is making, we can decrease the uh, probability of, uh, increase the probability of error by simply having sigma go directly towards rho, straight to rho. You know, the gradient goes to is, you know, sigma goes to sigma plus alpha rho minus sigma will increase the error because this is a linear function, once again, for fixed m, it's a linear function, the probability of error is a linear function of sigma. And so, uh, you know, just by going straight towards this, the uh, actual thing, the actual data, a density matrix, you will do better. <clears throat> again, it's convex optimization of a linear function, so this is super, about as simple as you can possibly get. And there is a unique fixed point for rho, for sigma is equal to rho. <coughs> it wants, the general want to maximize the probability of error. The uh, discriminator, or which is minimizing the probability of success. I, I phrased it in the opposite way from the way that it's phrased because the way that this Hellstrom measurements are phrased in, in the quantum information community is to look in terms of minimum error uh, measurement, but we could take, you know, the maximum success, which is one minus the error. And the, the conversion, so here you're doing three peaks D, and then are you doing one step of gradient in uh, sigma, and then you alternate? Yeah, if you do it that way, then, then this will, so then, you yeah. Get both functions are linear, you don't have to, take the having mean max type situation here, if both of them are linear, and you're doing the last Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I actually didn't. I did not. I did not prove convergence here. Um, <clears throat> uh, but but uh, yeah. So but it, that's it. Would be so. I, let me phrase it. It would be interesting to simulate this process. And actually, immediately when we posted the paper, actually within two weeks, some people had done an experiment for, on this <laughs> to show it show it in action. Uh, uh, it did converge then in the experiment. So it would be interesting to look at pathological cases where it fails to converge, just like the kinds of things that you were looking at. Because that I, when you gave your talk yesterday, I said, I was saying to myself, I bet there are cases where this would get screwed up. And it would be very interesting to figure out what those are. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, they're not told anything. That's the whole point of these generative adversarial networks is that they don't know anything about the probabilities of the data. Neither the discriminator nor the generator knows anything about the probabilities of the data to start with. What's, what's powerful about it is it starts with they have zero knowledge of what's going on. And then they know they, the, 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 the generator just tries out a bunch of random stuff. Then the discriminator will easily, you know, tries a random measurement, but but will rapidly get better at it because the generator is being an idiot. And then the but now the now the discriminator has, you know, is doing better. And now the generator, by trying to fool the discriminator, will get more bits of information about the real thing. So the cool thing about this is that, and this is super cool, by the way, is that it converges without them knowing anything about rho to begin with.
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 yeah, sure. So this assumes that <coughs> that you can do gradient descent in these high dimensional spaces. Yeah, absolutely. But also to get convergence, you're using both at the set of density matrices and convex and also at the set of theory M Correct correct. Yeah, for for the uh, for the discriminator, it's important that the set of POVMs is convex, and, or POVM operators is convex. And for the uh, for the generator, it's important that the set of uh, density matrices is convex. But if the generator had to output a pure state, then you would have a convergence. If the generator had to output a pure state, yeah, that's possible. So you mean if there's if there's a uh, just a pure state? Well, well, I'm just saying if I make the space non-convex. Right. Now, I don't think I don't think that that would I mean a pure state has a density matrix right so. Right, that's true. That's an interesting question. I don't. But it would be interesting to come up with a restriction like that that to see what would happen to make things non convex. But <clears throat> but I mean the, the the slavish the slavish following of the proof. Well, it's not slavishly following because actually. At first, I thought I would just slavishly follow the proof, and I'd end up with all these KL divergences and stuff like that. And it took me a month or two to figure out. I was trying that, and it didn't work at all. And because then I realized, oh, the whole thing is a lot easier than I thought, because this is actually very easy. So, but in the spirit of slavishly following the proof, I will now say, so <clears throat> suppose now that the discriminator is endowed with a quantum circuit that takes in the quantum state and then makes a POVM on it, and she has weights that she gets to update to do better. And the discriminator, so the generator is endowed with a quantum circuit that allows him to update the weights of his circuit to generate sigma because of the well-known fact that large-scale quantum perceptrons with many weights can follow gradients in the space of, of, of states. <laughs> then this will converge. <laughs> I've, proved, I've proved that this will converge to the optimal point. <laughs> And this is actually, maybe I can actually, we actually really did this, and that was, of course, this had to go in the paper. So let me see if I can actually find the point As where we say that. As experiments may someday show. As experiments may someday show. Exactly. Yeah. Let, me, let me see if I actually, what were we actually saying? <laughs> I can't, I, I should have found this report. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, I can't find it, so I, I shouldn't go through this. Oh, maybe I'll find it by the end. Okay, so, yeah, because actually, I, I, I don't want to. Yeah, so, anyway, it was, it was fun. And by the way, this paper got, I'd never had a paper get accepted by PRL so rapidly as this paper. <laughs> we submitted it. It was accepted within three days or something like that. Be yeah. Was there a promise like how many equations it takes No. Because, because as he was saying, it was like it, it might not converge, right? I mean, it, it's conceivable. If like given what they're doing, it you know it might it might indeed not converge. It could they could like chase each other around the the, uh, the elm tree, you know. <laughs> okay, but now I think that there's something interesting. So this is this is a, the was, is the simple part. So um, now, <clears throat> however, let's actually assume that this and this is the fully quantum version. So everything here. Is, uh, and everything here is, is relatively easy. Let me get rid of it now. And let's start looking at some more interesting things. So now the thing is, we could say, suppose that the, uh, uh, the real data is not quantum mechanical, but it's some, uh, it's some data, classical data x, that result from making measurements on rho, where, for example, just because Scott is sitting right here in the front row, for example, rho could be a, quant a pure state created from a shallow quantum circuit with uh, random, randomly selected quantum logic gates. <clears throat> and uh, now, suppose that the generator is completely classical. but equipped with a random number generator. So the, the, this data now, this is classical data, it's being produced with probabilities P of X, and it comes from making measurements on the outputs of some small quantum circuit. Now the data, the, the, 
the, cla the classical generator has to produce data with probabilities of qx that are supposed to match p of x, but now that the generator is, is just given a classical computer and a random number generator. And then because of well-known results from the field of quantum supremacy, or if one doesn't like the word supremacy, which I famously don't, we'll call it, we can call it advantage. Uh, <laughs> yes, hate supremacy. Because <laughs> hate, hate is the new love, right? So <laughs> yes, it's tough love, but still. <laughs> uh, um, this implies that uh, f for any, any classical strategy, generator, generator strategy, uh, P minus Q is bounded away, is bounded from away from zero. This is results actually, I mean, Scott is the one who's pro pro proved the most of these, but there are lots of results on these. Which means like because the classical uh, fake, fake or, you know, generator can't just generate the same distribution. Yeah, so there's a, I mean, uh, with plausible assumptions of computational complexity, if there is a bound on the computational power of the classical generator, then he cannot actually generate anything that approximates P in any realistic fashion. Right, well, so we can look at that. Yeah. So we just, well, if everything's completely quantum, then, then we just saw that like it's, it's, it's fine. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so, but this is interesting. So, so now let's say, what, how about the discriminator? Uh, well, a measurement, a classical measurement exists, right? that will discriminate P from Q for any Q that the generator is generating. Um, it exists, so, so uh, um, uh, if you assume that she can find it, then she can find it. But, you know, <laughs> but it's not clear that she can find it. Not clear how how she can find it, even given a quantum computer. <clears throat> um, this, of course, is one of the main features of quantum supremacy, quantum advantage. It's like, well, we know that there exists a measurement that would discriminate between these probability distributions. But the only way that people know how to find them out right now is to do gigantic searches with classical computers like for like using thousands of hours of supercomputer time to try to figure out what they are. And it is not known if there's a way using a quantum computer to find this. Uh, it would be great, that, this would be a wonderful thing, right? as I'm sure Scott would agree, if we, if we could figure out a quantum algorithm to figure out how to make, find these measurements. But it's really unclear how to do that. But I mean, with the existing style of quantum, supremacy arguments, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the very argument that tells you that the problem is hard also tells you that the verification should be hard. The verification should be hard, exactly, that's right, exactly, right. <laughs> right, that's right, because yeah. indeed, because if, if you could actually figure out what to do, then you would know what P is, and if you knew what P is, you would have had to do these calculations, and so if you had done these calculations, then, well, anyway, it would take you a very, very long time. That's right, yeah, so it would be nice to have other flavors. But, you know, in this case, the, the <coughs> Game does not converge, does not converge to the fixed point. That is, <clears throat> even though in the kind of the quantum quantum game, uh, uh, the game very simply goes, has this very simple and simply provable fixed point um, uh, where the generator generates the same, it's the same uh, statistics as the data, uh, quantum supremacy then provides an obstacle for the quantum classical game and prevents it from actually converging. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> uh, uh, if the, in this case, if the, um, uh, if the generator, we could also look at the discriminator uh, 
classical. So again, we're in this context where um, the data is being generated from some quantum system with certain set of probabilities. And, um, uh, but now we could allow that the, uh, we have uh, Q of X generated from sigma. So now we actually can have the generator quantum. And again, this actually raises a bunch of open questions because, um, uh, <coughs> Well, under the assumption that the discriminator can actually tell these probabilities P of X from Q of X, you know, that is so she can find some measurement to make, then she could, she could improve her measurement. But, and the generator, the quantum generator can always in principle now improve the states that he's, he's doing because he now has a quantum device so he can mimic what's going on. But here it is, <laughs> now we have another open question. So here's an open question. So it's we don't know, um, don't know whether a discriminator can find uh, optimal measurement for this kind of converse reason about quantum supremacy that Scott was making, that is, you know, can she find this measure? We don't know, because the only way we know how to find these kinds of measurements are just because you know, we simulate the whole quantum computer and that's hard to do. So we don't know. So if she could, generator could uh, converge sigma going to rho. Modulo, of course, these you know, assumptions about quantum perceptrons following uh, following tracks and <laughs> gradients in space. So, but so there could be distributions that are quantum sampleable, uh, you know, which are hard to sample classically, but where you know, a quantum machine could learn to sample from that very same distribution. Right, right. so that's like what I'm saying. Right. So, yeah. right, so the, the here, quantum sampling as a generator is actually trying to generate things with that. So, yeah. so, so it seems re plausible and, and that, that indeed that the generator ought to be able to, to match it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, According to the, actually, I think according to the same, I think we can make the same kind of argument we had before with the measurements tossed in there to say if the generator is trying to emulate this row right here and somebody's comparing the distribution row with, with the results of measurements you're making on sigma, then you ought to be able to construct a sigma that will generate the same results. <clears throat> so that's interesting. This is, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, once you move away from the quantum quantum, that which was extremely easy, then the, everything else becomes chock full of unknown questions. And then an extremely interesting one is um, uh, the data <laughs> is truly classical. <laughs> so <laughs> data is truly classical. We have P of X and now we have the quantum generator is generating Q of X from some sigma. But now the question is, can somebody equipped with a small quantum computer actually learn to generate classical data that's just being generated classically? And that actually is, uh, that would be uh, very cool. Um, uh, and I think that, that here uh, the answer is yes. And, um, uh, can, so I'll say, can a quantum generator beat a classical generator? <clears throat> um, so here I would say the answer is yes under, <laughs> under for a some slightly artificial problem, which is actually somewhat relevant. If my data, data is, uh, uh, generated from, um, we have vectors that belong to some very high dimensional vector space. I'm just going to make it c to the n and large. And um, we make measurements of some operator. See, I'm just going to make it quantum mechanical. Trace of a x, and then we have trace of a squared x, trace of a cubed x. Uh, sorry, uh, x 
stagger. I'll just do it like this. That is to say we have the mean value of A plus higher moments. So we're sampling from some quantum measurement made on this, or a classical version of a quantum measurement, right? So this is classical data. It's, it's set in some high dimensional space. It's set up to mimic this quantum system. We never said anything that, but, but put any restraint on how the data is generated. So this could be generated classically. Then the quantum generator ought to be able to mimic this. You know, simply by by finding rho such that trace rho a, trace rho a squared, trace rho a cubed, etc., matches the observed moments. And this is using using resources poly log of n because the point is that here's these vectors in this huge dimensional space and you're sampling from these these measurements that are mimic mimic quantum measurements but then the uh, classical gen a quantum generator ought to be able to find this because you know you're just using a classical system to mimic some actual quantum system right here uh, but here we we suspect that classical generator can't. Can't without using a lot of resources, so poly n. So a classical generator, of course, could like try to mimic this process and go search for things in this high dimensional space, but it would need a huge honking computer. It has to, it has to actually, it's, it has to actually, you know, if n is 10 to the 12th, then um, the classical computer has got to be starting to evaluate products of 10 to the 12th by 10 to the 12th non-sparse matrices. That's considered to be hard to do Avogadro's numbers of operations. Whereas the quantum computer can just like do things with 40 qubits. That's a moment matching. Yeah, it's a moment matching. Okay. Yeah, this is, I'm using him as a resource here. Yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. That we didn't look at that. Yeah. So I mean, the question is right. So can the discriminator, um, uh, given given these um, given this data stream that was generated at this point, how well can she do? Yeah, I don't know how. So so clearly people do this, right? Because it, it's obviously it's a good thing. Clearly, it's a good thing to do. Indeed, what you were doing, you could say, was being the optimal one for, for optimizing the first and second moments, right? So when a Gaussian, uh, I, so I, I would be, after hearing your talk yesterday, I bet you dollars to donuts that, that your, your, your quadratic loss function discriminator is the optimal one for matching that. So it would be, see, be perverse if that were not true. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. So that's a good question. And I don't know if the discriminator, if that helps the discriminator to be quantum or classical, could well make help the discriminator to be quantum mechanical in this kind of situation. Because, you know, moment matching, since quantum mechanics is all about vectors and matrices on very high dimensional vector spaces, then, you know, it makes it, things a lot easier when, when you're told that the actual, you have an assurance that your actual data was generated in that fashion. Right. Yes. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're very interesting. Yeah, I'll have to, we'll, let's talk after this and let me get some references from you. <coughs> I'm, I'm bringing this up because um, actually I was hoping to get Scott's impression about this. This is, it's, it's, uh, it's, because uh, you've been working on these problems of, you know, when things like boson sampling and correlation and, um, you know, when it's possible for quantum systems to generate statistics that you can't generate otherwise. This is the converse problem, right? I mean, it's, it's, we, we want to have a quantum system that we're going to generate statistics to map some, a classical thing that's very high dimensional, but, uh, but uh, and so we know the quantum thing can match it, but it might not be matchable classically. So this is a kind of an, a question that's similar to, but not the same as, the kinds of questions you've been asking for a long time. And it would be interesting, I would be interested in knowing if it's possible actually to prove that this is hard to do classically. Yeah, the question is, so, so I, I have it, let's just take it, I have a, a measure, let's think of it quantum mechanically, right? So suppose that the actual data was being generated quantum mechanically by just making, you're just making some measurement of some sparse or low rank operator on a high dimensional space, and you're given some set of states, so some density matrix. And you just, you, the measurement just yields answers for this, and then, and then you have some, you get the mean value and you get the moments of this measurement. So um, is there some, can, could one prove that one can't generate this kind of, same kind of process classically? Or, wait, wait, can you, could you do you require, yeah, can you, can, can you not generate it with poly log n resources, right? You mean like with, with, with uh, The classical, the classical system, again, it's, it's given, it's not even that, right, because it's just actually, you're given, somebody gives you a, a data stream, right, which is a result of this measurement. We could even just say it's like, we're making a measurement as operator A on a high dimensional space, and we're given these some vectors, or it could be a pure state that we're being given, or some ensemble states that are the inputs for it. And then we're trying to match that with a, uh, a classical generator. Now, <clears throat> it somehow it seems to me that these results on quantum supremacy should forbid that if... I mean, well, but I mean, even more, more simply, you just Oh, I'm sure you could do that. Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of thing you could do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so I guess you're right. So if you actually, if A is produced by some, this is some computational stuff that's being right. produced, right. for instance, outputs of yeah. some small quantum circuit or something like that, then you ought not be able to generate this classically. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I've got a, a couple more minutes here um, because, uh, <clears throat> because this turned out, to, <laughs> it turns out to be, in some sense, a rather simple, simple though to me at any rate, intriguing, uh, intriguing, uh, set of questions that are raised by the quantization of generative adversarial networks. Um, and I'd like to, I thought I might use the remaining little bit of time to just say a few words about quantum machine learning in general. But before I do that, are there any further questions about these QGANs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like, uh, I, I think it was like some four qubit experiment or something like that. So the, the, the data's two, two qubits, two qubit states, and maybe it was even just one qubit, I don't know. I mean, but you, it's, it's perfectly reasonable thing to do with, with a two qubit experiment where, you know, you have, you have a gen, or maybe a four, you need, your data is a qubit, real data is a qubit, your fake data is a qubit, the, the generator is trying to, prepare in the same state as this, and the discriminator is making measurements, single qubit measurements on this, right? So probably you could do it with three qubits experiment. I, I didn't actually, I've, I haven't, I'm not sure the, the experiment has actually been published yet, so I don't know exactly how it works. <clears throat> but you know, hey, if the folks at IBM can do a, a two qubit experiment and claim to have generated, have to have, uh, in the first demonstration of a quantum support vector machine, <coughs> which, which <coughs> I have to give that paper credit. I mean, we was talked about yesterday. I, will, I would like to apologize for not being at the talk. A bunch of us were at a restaurant, and 
they, it was the slowest restaurant ever. <laughs> and we were unable to actually get out uh, by in time for your talk. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, this IBM experiment that was talked about yesterday, it's a two qubit experiment. They did a support vector machine, which is also known in the lingo of quantum mechanics as a von Neumann measurement with two outcomes, because von Neumann measurement, or any quantum measurement with two outcomes is equivalent to a support vector machine. So, um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so uh, 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 if you've been done a two qubit experiment, this is a perfectly reasonable three qubit experiment. You know, deep quantum learning on with two qubits, yes. Yeah, well, I actually let me just say let me just say how, how this works because uh, uh, this is something somewhat useful. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a support vector machine. Is <clears throat> if I've got you know two clusters of points, I want to draw the optimal separating hyperplane between them, and um. <clears throat> So uh, uh, if I have a, if each point here, I'll call these, you know, psi, j, and each point here, we call them phi, j. Um, then if I have a, this is, I'll call this m0, m1, where m0, this is a, a, a POVM, positive operated value measure. And then we say, if trace m0, uh, rho uh, is greater than or equal to one half. We assign it over here. If trace m one is greater than or equal to half, we assign it over there. And um, uh, this is just saying, you know, this m zero m one identifies this hyperplane, and this condition says am I on this side of the hyperplane or on that side of the hyperplane. So, a a any two valued Operate quantum operator, uh, any two valued generalized quantum measurement is a support vector machine, <coughs> which, is, um, which is nice. But somehow, uh, <coughs> somehow it makes it less, slightly less impressive to say we did the first demonstration of a quantum support vector machine. That's, uh, that's, it's not true that people have not done two valued quantum measurements in the past. So uh, <coughs> they didn't call them support vector machines. Um, <coughs> Anyway, by the way, I'm not saying, I actually really love this IBM paper. I think it's a wonderful paper. I'm just being, figure it's important to criticize one's own field as well. <clears throat> so let me actually, I just like, this, I actually should stop here. So I won't actually, um, I, I will just say just about, about quantum machine learning is that this is a very interesting field. Um, not merely because machine learning is trendy, and so quantum machine learning should be trendy. Uh, <laughs> Machine learning itself, classical machine learning, is an extremely interesting field conceptually, even, even though it is trendy. And um, uh, uh, there, it raises lots of very interesting questions. And um, uh, whether one can actually um, do, we, you know, we now have quantum algorithms. There are basically two kinds of quantum algorithms for machine learning. There are linear algebra-based methods, which use the fact that basically anything that you can do in MATLAB, you can do exponentially faster in a quantum, quantum computer. Um, uh, these require having a quantum random access memory, by and large, that will take a classical vector and map it into a quantum mechanical vector. This is, this is n bits, classical bits. This is log n qubits. If one could build such a device, that would be tremendously enabling, and there would be a whole bunch of, of quantum data analysis and quantum machine learning programs that would be doable. And then more recently, as this IBM paper and works from Microsoft that Nathan is a co-author on have been looked at, we could also look at deep quantum learning, where, um, <clears throat> where here, there are no, here there are theoretical guarantees of exponential speed up. After you've done this mapping, then because you can do all this matrix inversion and quantum wave transforms and finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues exponentially faster, once you've mapped the thing to a quantum state, you're doing exponentially better. And whether you can actually build such devices is a very interesting question. And how do you extract the answer? Right. <coughs> right. So, uh, right. 
uh, yeah, I won't, I won't say that. How do you extract the answer is an interesting question. So it's very important, and uh, Nathan knows very well because we worked on this, to set up the problem in such a way that you're revealing something where you can't extract the answer. Because if you've given the answer in terms of a quantum state, and you have to measure the whole quantum state to get the answer to what you want, then you're screwed. That's a technical term. In deep quantum learning, okay, we have, you know, we have quantum circuits with many gates in them, and then, you know, rotations, and we can tune these. And people can build stuff like this. And we also actually have the adiabatic or, or uh, quantum annealing version of this, which are larger. And um, can you actually make them the D-Wave machine, for instance, is a great system for doing deep quantum learning on. Can you actually find patterns and classify patterns you can't do classically? We have no idea. We just don't know. But this is, and nor, moreover, you can't prove anything here for the same reasons you can't prove anything classically. It's even worse in the quantum mechanical case because you can't even simulate them classically. And so this is, I think, an, an if you build them, they will come kind of question. But both of these, these parts have, have, are, are tremendously rich applications of quantum information processing, and it's a lot of fun to work on. So. Right, that's true. Though I mean, this is you know, this is an interesting question. I think we've talked about this. So, so you know, suppose you're popping in this, and you 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 have some u of your weight space acting on. Sorry, you have some initial state psi. You have some set of weights which determines your quantum circuit, and you have u of the weight space acting on psi. Well, you know, if this is, system is computationally universal, that you could set up something that would, for instance, factor large numbers. But it seems actually, I would say, my guess is, can you actually do stochastic gradient descent in the space of circuits to find something that will factor large numbers? My guess is no. That would be my guess. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, thank you. <laughs>Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, I, I did, I, I, I did, I did say, I did say something about it, say, if we ignore the problem of sample complexity, then we can say that Alice is, sorry, that the, the discriminator converges to the, to the proper point. Yeah, that, that I, I would say, um, the reason I'm ignore, I was ignoring is that I don't know the answer to that. I think that's a very interesting question. Right, and actually I was hoping that you would be able to tell me that. <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't, hadn't arrived by the time of your talk, but I'd heard your talk about gradient estimation, and it seemed, I, would been, I was wondering whether your methods for gradient estimation would actually, given that this is a very straightforward linear problem, whether it's the simplest thing to imagine about what, that you could try to find the gradient of. So I wonder if, if, how hard it is, like you. But I was hoping you knew the answer. <laughs>
Yeah. But if you say you have to output a new example, one that's right. never been seen before by anybody, right? Yeah, then yeah, I yeah. wouldn't know how to generate such an example without using a quantum computer. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that that's 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 very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's definitely the spirit of what I was describing. I mean, if you just take if you just take uh, you know, um, well, if you take linear codes and and um, and you say, well, I want I so the the condition of being in the in the sp code space is that you're, for instance, in the kernel of some linear operator, yeah, right, right, right. right? And and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it can certainly be verified. So yeah, and it might take order time n if the, if it's an n by n matrix to verify this classically, but you could verify it in time log n quantum mechanically. Oh so. well, I mean, I'm I'm not even worried about. I mean, I'm just you know the class. I'm just worried that the classical verification could be polynomial. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Yeah, generically, unless it's. Totally, but, I want, yeah. but I want the generation. You know, just like you know, in order to get the kind of separation that you wanted, I want the generation to require a quantum computer. I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. yeah. This would be. Yeah, it would be yeah, nice yeah. to. The, 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 great. I think that that right. Just to summarize, I guess I said it before, but the, these kinds of machine learning problems suggest other types of quantum supremacy that might be more amenable to proof or to actual demonstration. <laughs> so, and these are just open, these are open questions. But yeah. that's a very interesting way of phrasing it. Thank you.